Good morning, and welcome to worship at Christ Our Anchor Presbyterian Church. We welcome you and we invite you to welcome each other and greet each other online this morning. As we do need to worship virtually right now, um, that is the safest way that we can all stay healthy. And although we would love to be face to face, this is an important um, time for us to just stay connected in the ways that we can and understand that there are many ways that we can gather. I am not Jessie Lowry, your pastor. She is at home on maternity leave waiting to welcome her new baby and bring um, a new baby into the family. My name is Dottie LaPenta and I have been with you before. Um, when Penny was born, I was here and I actually go back way beyond that time as a friend of Christ Our Anchor, even back to the beginnings of your congregation. And I understand you're getting ready to celebrate a wonderful, wonderful um, anniversary this year. Um, my first week here, what I have learned is that you are a very busy church. You are busy in good and life-giving ways and nothing is stopping you from your mission, your outreach, and your justice endeavors. So I would encourage you to read the announcements and the opportunities thoroughly so that you can be involved and stay connected. Some things are coming up this very week. The green team of Christ Our Anchor would like to highlight the virtual stakeholder rally that the Presbytery is sponsoring this Friday in support of the Maryland Environmental Human Rights Amendment. The link for that virtual rally is in the COA hopes and notes this week. Also, the playground group that was snowed out last week, um, they will meet tomorrow from 3.30 to 5. Um, and so uh, please bring your children and have a good time at the outdoors. Uh, the mission committee is sponsoring a winter clothing drive for the Lighthouse Shelter, asking the congregation to donate new socks, waterproof gloves and hats and boots, which can be gently used. Um, and they're looking to supply these things for about 20 men and women. The sign-up sheet is on this week's hopes and notes, and this uh, will go through February the 6th. I'm just highlighting all the things that are going on in this community. So be sure to get filled in through the communications that come from the church office. Um, so now let us um, come together and worship God. Please join me in our opening prayer. Gracious God, out of a lifeless stump, you called forth a new and living shoot. You came to the world not as a king, but as a baby. When the world was dark, you sent a star to guide the way. And even in the wild discord of life, you still proclaim a vision of peace. You often reveal your sustaining presence in small, unassuming ways. We can easily miss seeing you. So give us the will to hope fiercely, for even in the darkest dark, something tender and tiny continues to grow, changing the world, one miracle at a time. As we listen for your word this day, strengthen us to go into the world to yearn for you, expect you, and notice that you are near. Amen. So this morning, I'd like to greet all the children, children of all ages of Christ our anchor. In a few minutes, we are going to hear a story from the Bible about a time when Jesus went to a wedding. That Jesus, that Jesus certainly likes to be included in our lives at all times, whether we are having a hard day or whether we're at a birthday party and having a lot of fun. I mean, Jesus went to a wedding. We read that in the Bible, so that we know that Jesus did like to go to parties. And, you know, we can't see Jesus. We can't see Jesus in a physical body with us, but we know that Jesus is here with us because Jesus works through many different people so that we can be sure that God loves us. God loves us so much. And God sent Jesus to teach us about the ways of God and to teach how special and important we are 
because God needs our help in making the world a better place. So even though we can't see Jesus physically, we know Jesus is with us because other people care for us and love us. Now today, as you have noticed, there is someone else that's not with us, another person, but her love is with us, and that's your pastor, Pastor Jesse. Now, in a few months, you're going to be able to see her again in the flesh, see her body right here with you, because she is still your pastor. But she is going to have a baby, so she needs to take some time now to be with her family, to have her baby, to care for herself and her new baby and her family. <clears throat> but she is still your pastor, and she will be back here with you soon. And she'll come back with her family and with her new baby and introduce you to the new baby. So she will be back. But for the next couple of months, my name is Pastor Dottie, and I'm going to be with you while Pastor Jesse is away. Now, I wish we could be together in person so that I could get to know you better and so that I could bring you up front during the time with our children and talk with you. But right now, we have to do what's best for our health. But I want you to know that I believe that children, that kiddos are a very special part of the church family. So I've decided that in the few months that I'm with you, I am going to be a cheerleader for Miss Debbie Barber, who really so creatively plans things for the children of this church so that we can stay connected in a time when we just can't be indoors together. Because you know what? We would never want you to think that we have forgotten about the children of Christ, our anchor. Because we are so thankful for you. And we will be here for you and your family. And we really look forward to the time when we can be together. And I look forward to seeing you and getting to know you. And we will be able to do that again when we know that it is safe and right for us to be together. Now, I think it would be a really good idea if we said a prayer for Pastor Jessie and her family this morning. And I know if you want to blow her a kiss, if you want to wave to her, I just have a feeling she's going to know that you are thinking about her. And as she sends her love to you, that you are sending your love to her. So let's pray together. Dear God, Bless Pastor Jesse, Jason, and Penny, and take good care of them. Help them to feel our love in this time that they are away from us. Help Pastor Jesse's body to be strong, and help her days to be joyful. Amen. I hope all of you have a good week, and I'll look forward to being with you either virtually or hopefully sometime soon in person. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament, Psalm 104, verses 10 through 15. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the bird of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for humans to use, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a painting at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, entitled The Marriage Feast at Cana by the Italian artist Sebastiano Ricci. It depicts the wedding guests in the foreground of the painting filling their chalices with wine from the stone jars, as the scripture said. It's a very celebratory scene, lots of people, lots of color, music, singing, feasting. But at first, as I looked at this painting, I couldn't find Jesus in the crowd. My thought was, hey, wait a minute. Um, don't these guests know that if it weren't for Jesus, there wouldn't be wine in those stone jars? The scene opens by telling us that the wine had given out. But these guests filling their chalices had no clue. Then I spotted him, Jesus, sitting inconspicuously among the people, engaged in conversation, celebrating a marriage, having a good time, but just another guest at a wedding. And that's the way Jesus wanted it. This first miracle of Jesus, as recorded by John, is such a central scene in my mind, but maybe it was no big deal. I mean, of, of course, it was a big deal, but by way of a mostly unnoticed miracle that changed the day and paved the way for a continuous celebration. Let's think about this whole scene, this whole wedding event for a moment. We are at a wedding. A wedding celebrates a new relationship with so many hopes for a shared future all amid the community of friends and family. Now, in Jesus' day and time at a celebration like this, it would have been a serious loss of face, a great embarrassment to the host had the wine run out. So there are these six stone jars used for the ritual of purification. And John gives us a lot of detail about these stone jars in this passage. You see, in the Jewish tradition, there is a ritual called netalat yadahim, where people wash their hands one at a time and say a blessing before a meal. Now, these jars held 20 to 30 gallons of water. That's 180 gallons of water at the most. So that means a lot of people could wash their hands. This was a big party with a lot of guests. Now this ritual of cleansing had apparently already happened because the jars were empty. 
So Jesus takes these structures, these jars of an old tradition, and now he is going to do something new with them. So he instructs the servants to fill the stone jars with water. And when some of the water was drawn out and taken to the chief steward, it wasn't water that he tasted, but wine. And not just any old wine, the good wine. The wine usually served first. And now there were 180 gallons of wine. The steward gave the bridegroom the credit for running down to the wine store and replenishing the wine so that the celebration could continue. But the servants knew. The disciples knew. Jesus' mother knew. And we know. It was Jesus who saw to it that the celebration prevailed. There are several Old Testament references to an abundance of overflowing wine being associated with the day of the Lord. So I think the writer of John's Gospel is trying to let us in on some things. On the miracle, first of all, on the abundance of wine, and making the connection to Jesus' identity as Lord very early in this Gospel. But the reality is that Jesus' first miracle was rather subtle. I mean, most of the guests didn't even notice. What else is God up to in the world that no one seems to notice? We think of God as big. God encompasses big. But maybe redemption and transformation happen in small ways, small subtle ways that change things in big ways. Why else would God have come into the world by way of a newborn who had no headlines, no cloud descending, no confetti parade? I mean, who noticed? Who noticed the birth? Some shepherds? Joseph? Mary? And we haven't spoken about Mary yet in this story of the wedding at Cana. She had a major role. And many people, when they read this story, they're very disappointed in Jesus' interactions with his mother, calling her woman. That has a jarring connotation for us today that may not have been as irritating in Jesus' time. But we can kind of imagine Jesus rolling his eyes at his mother as he says, what concern of it is mine that they're running out of wine? Well, I agree that Jesus might benefit from a copy of Miss Manners and a reminder to honor your father and mother. But I think what is missed is that for some reason, and we don't know why, Mary had confidence in what her son would be able to do. What gave Mary this confidence? Had she noticed that when Jesus was around, things happened? Life-changing? Transformative? Redemptive? Good things happened? Sometimes we don't see the central moment of change and transformation. We only see the results. Sometimes we might not even put God's name into something that is life-changing. And I don't think serving God's ego and recognition is really what matters at all to God. What matters to God is that God's children get their lives back when they are lost. What matters to God is our experience of hope, grace, peace, and joy. What matters to God is that the celebration can continue. The theologian Richard Rohr has said, you know what, I have committed myself to joy. Joy must be announced. And in some form, joy must be taken to refugees, to slum dwellers, to saddened prisoners, to angry prophets. And now and then, we must even announce joy to ourselves. For in the prison of cynicism, contempt, and scorn, Someone must believe in joy. 
There's a scene in the book called The Music Shop by Rachel Joyce that is a story of redemption in the most surprising place. In this story, Frank is the owner of the music shop. It is 1988, and the representatives from various companies want Frank to market CDs because they are the future of recordings. Well, that day has certainly passed. But Frank is only interested in selling vinyl records. Frank's background is quite tumultuous. His shop is one of, on the back streets of London called Unity Street. And this street is frequented by very few people now that the big box stores have come on the scene. But somehow people find their way to Frank's music shop. Some come to buy vinyl records, but most of the people who come through Frank's doors are those who would otherwise just be roaming the streets or weeping in their one-room flats. But they come into this music shop and Frank engages them and they tell Frank their story. There seems to be no sad stories that Frank could not shoulder. The one treasure that Frank did have from his very difficult upbringing is his knowledge and his insight into music, all genres. Frank built listening booths in his shop from old wardrobe dressers so that people could sit in these old wardrobe dressers with headphones and listen to Frank's music recommendations for them. Frank might say to them, ah, oh, let me have you listen to some Aretha Franklin and see what you think. Or Frank might say, you know what, I'm going to put on some Vivaldi, and I want you to listen for how Vivaldi makes each individual instrument a star of the show. Suddenly you realize you're listening to wind and rain and the instruments sound like a storm or singing birds. And you might even find yourself that you're in a day that is so hot you can hardly move, but, but you really, really have to listen. Well, one day the tattoo artist Maud, who also owned a shop on Unity Street, came into the music shop. Frank said to Maud, come here Maud, here, sit in there and put on these headphones because there's something I would like you to hear. Maud said, I'm not sitting in old, an old stupid cupboard. You're not going to get me in there. But Maud soon found herself sitting on a velvet chair in Frank's homemade listening booth with a headset so large, it was like wearing a hat full of music. She shut the door, and it was a very strange feeling because it reminded her of the days when she was a little girl. And she would go in the closet and hide among her mom's dresses and her dad's suit, trying not to breathe so she wouldn't be found. Frank said from the other side of the door, I think you're going to like this. It's Barber, Adagio for Strings. Who the heck is Barber, thought Maud. The only thing she ever played was Def Leppard and his heavy metal, and the louder she played it, the better. She needed anything that would silence those voices that played continuously in her head, those voices that screamed, where is that child? Fetch the belt. Everything's wrong with that child. Why can't she just be a good little girl? Well, the music started, and it was like Maud had walked through a magic door. It was so sad and so simple that it could break your heart, but it didn't. From the softest beginnings, it built and built as if the music were climbing a set of stairs and the violins were screaming, ah, and then the music stopped, nothing. Maud's heart had swooped in her mouth. When the music started again, she was in tears. It was like a switch had been flicked and her eyes were spouts of running tears. Because in those few moments, she had been changed. Those few moments told her that life goes on even when you think it can't. Oh, she knew there's cruelty in the world. She knew bad things in this world are for certain. 
But that day she discovered this is in the world too. This, she didn't know exactly what to call it, this, this beauty, this hope, this message that, that we are worthy and the human adventure is worth it after all. As Maud left the booth, the music stayed with her. The music shop was the same. Maud's past was the same. But now there was this whatever it was, redemption, transformation, whatever it was, it was truth. It was truth by way of a small, subtle miracle. Was it okay, asked Frank. How could Maud say? How do you tell someone that by being in a cupboard for eight minutes, your life has been changed? Christ our anchor friends, the God who shows up in a teenager's womb, the God who shows up in a baby born in an inconspicuous place, the God who shows up as just another guest at a wedding is likely to show up anywhere. Don't put anything past God. Last week, you all received your individual star words for the year 2022. But maybe as a community, as a community of faithful people, our star word for this year could be notice. Notice. Notice where God is at work. Notice where God is at work and walk into those places and be a part of it. After that wedding at Cana, Jesus went down to Capernaum and his disciples and his mother followed him. Of course they did. They had noticed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
as we come together for a time of prayer, I want to encourage you to make any of your joys and concerns in the comments section or by emailing them to the church office. Um, I will do my best to keep up with all of those communications. We have people at work to make sure that, that names are getting on prayer lists or the concerns are being um, uh, forwarded to the deacons, the Stevens ministers, and to me. So please, um, by whatever way is um, best for you, please make these prayer concerns, joys and concerns, known to this community so that we can lift uh, you in prayer. And now let us come to a time in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-present God, you claim us as your own and call us your beloved from the beginning of time. Every day you want the words, you are my beloved, spoken in our ears. But we know the noise of the world and its expectations and judgments can for long periods of time drown out that still small voice that gives us the truth about ourselves. We are your beloved. You call us to your love and you send us out to love others. So hear our prayers this day as we hold the weary, the suffering, and the challenges of this day in our hearts and minds. Gracious God, there are so many sisters and brothers recovering from devastation and loss. We pray for strength and hope to be given for those recovering and rebuilding their lives from tornadoes, storms, and fires. Shelter and protect them and all those who are working to restore life. Be their refuge and their strength. We pray for our country and its leadership in a day and time when things seem to be so divided and we are uncertain of what can bring healing. Remind us that we do know who can bring healing. Lead us into tr trust, wisdom, truth, and a deeper understanding of the power of love rather than the power of domination and privilege. We pray for all the healthcare and frontline workers who have been dealing with COVID-19 for so long. We know they are weary. We thank you for vaccines and scientists who are working to bring us through this pandemic. Help us to be gracious, to not politicize community health. Sometimes we are confused by the messaging, but give us patience and trust and call us into action that will restore health and well being for all people. We pray for all those currently under medical care and those who may be receiving treatment or procedures this week. We pray that you will wrap them in peace and assurance, confident in the care they are receiving. We ask that you be with the family of Catherine and especially her friends, Bill and Rhonda Moore, as Catherine went to her eternal home this week. Keep them strong in the resurrection promise that there is nothing, not even death, that can separate us from God. We lift in our prayers this day Debbie Kingsman, and we offer continued prayers for Rich and Helen Kelly and their well-being. We thank you that Ann Hatcher is with us today and recovering well from her surgery, and we thank you that Bonnie Jean is also making good progress in her recovery from knee replacement. Gracious Lord, we heard this morning that you went to a wedding. We know you are present in our celebrations as well as our challenges. We thank you for Jason Barber's grandmother who celebrated her 90th birthday and we ask that you will help us to always make a place at the table for you in our celebrations. The Christ Our Anchor community is expecting a new member soon a baby who will be born into the Lowry family. We pray for Jesse, Jason, and Penny. We know the family has had a week of not feeling well, and we pray for your graceful healing and protective arms to hold and keep them. Help them to get the rest they need this week as they prepare in body, mind, and spirit to welcome their child into the world. We pray for all those who will be caring for them in labor and delivery, and we pray for Penny and her new role as a big sister. It can be a lot to understand. We thank you for the love and support that Jesse, Jason, and Penny have felt, 
and continue to feel from the Christ Our Anchor family. We ask your blessings upon this congregation and the energetic and inspiring leadership that seeks to do your will in the world. Help us to each day take notice of where you are. We pray all these things and more, the prayers in our hearts, in the name of Jesus who gathered us together and taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In these strange and different times, there are many ways for us to give our offering, and I would suggest that you read online the methods that are available to us. In the meantime, we know that God is the giver of all things, and we have the opportunity in our worship to return a portion. That is a blessing. Let us give cheerfully. Friends, go into this week and take notice. Take notice. Don't put anything past God. God is likely to show up anywhere. And may the God of hope give you the joy and peace in believing that causes us to abound with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.